today's speaker is a chemistry professor at the Rockville campus. Her name is Dr. Rachel Ndonye. Um, I always have a hard time, but Ndonye. Um, she went and did her undergraduate work in Kenya at um, the University of Kenya, Nairobi, I, I knew that. Um, after getting her bachelor's degree there, she went to the University of Connecticut and got her PhD before coming to Montgomery College where her principal responsibilities are teaching, curriculum development, um, and generally being an awesome professor like all of the professors here. Um, I'm sure no one out there will disagree with that. Um, the past several summers she spent at um, the uh, Technical University of Kenya working on a fellowship where she's been involved in curriculum development in chemistry. And I think you said you were developing a medicinal chemistry program as well as some chemical outreach in the local area. And it, I saw her presentation last year. It was a really interesting presentation. It was really good. And I th she did more work there this summer. So I think it should be a really good talk today. And I'm really glad to have Rachel here to speak to us today. So let's welcome her and listen to what she has to say. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'll begin by talking briefly about the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program. I'll summarize the education system in Kenya so that you're familiar with it. I'll talk about the Technical University of Kenya, which is a university I worked with, and briefly discuss the project activities I was involved in. And uh, I have a few examples of educational exchange programs uh, for MC faculty and um, also one for uh, MC students. And finally, I'll give some examples of competitive advantages in Kenya. Uh, so uh, the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program is funded by the Carnegie Foundation, which is one of the oldest uh, American grant-making uh, grant foundation. It was established by Andrew Carnegie, and its aim is to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. Uh, the foundation supports programs and initiatives that address today's problems in various areas, specifically democracy, education, and for education, it provides opportunities for stu American students to acquire the skills they need in order to compete in the global market. Uh, higher education and research in Africa, and international peace and security. So the program I was involved in is under higher education and research in Africa. Uh, the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program is a two-year grant. It's on its second cycle. It was started uh, in 2013, so it's a relatively new program. And its aim is to mobilize African diaspora in order to facilitate international higher education engagement. And this is made possible by pairing the African-born scholars with accredited, uh, at accredited higher education institutions, either in the US or Canada, with uh, higher education institutions in six African countries. And those are the six African countries. So it's not all our, our countries in Africa. Uh, the program is managed by the Institute of International Education. I know that's familiar. Um, and duration of one visit is usually uh, from 14, maximum three months. Uh, the fellowship funds scholars uh, stipend, visa cost, health insurance, and international air travel. And the program encourages African host institutions or the institutions which work with the African-born scholars to cost share. And mostly they provide housing, meals, and local transportation. Uh, the eligible educational projects which are funded by the program are in three areas, curriculum co-development, research collaboration, graduate student mentoring, and training. And the projects are proposed and driven by us institutions in Africa. So the African-born scholars do not propose the projects, they just work on them. Uh, so I'll briefly mention about Kenya. If some of you are not familiar with Kenya. Uh, Kenya is in Africa. It's uh, located along the equator and also along the Indian Ocean. 
and there are 54 African countries. Uh, Kenyan's competitive advantage is availability of natural resources. I'll give some examples later in my presentation. And the education system structure is very similar to the US system. Uh, it's called 844 system. Eight stands for eight years in uh, what they call primary education, that is both uh, elementary and middle school, four years in high school, and at least four years in a degree awarding institution. Obvious students must complete kindergarten before joining uh, primary school or elementary school. Education in public schools is free and not compulsory, but it was made free in 2001, so before it wasn't. Uh, the standardized exams are taken at the completion of primary, which is the same as last year of uh, middle school and high school nationwide. And they are administered from mid-October to mid-November, so they just completed that. And the national examination results are uh, used for admission to high school, universities, training, and technical institutions. So that, that's the equivalent of SAT in America. And uh, about 50% of students in primary school uh, proceed to high school. So that means about 50% never get uh, high school education. And uh, out of the students who sit for high school exam, final exam, the national exam, about 28% score at least a C plus, which is the minimum score required to join a university. Uh, the others end up joining technical institutions. Some of us never get any university education. So currently there are 58 universities. And in about, in 2000, there were only 20 universities. So most, yeah. Uh, more than 30 universities have been created the last 15 years, so they're relatively new institutions. Uh, unlike in the US where um, to join medical school you must have a bachelor's degree, and we know pharmacy school also recommend having a bachelor's degree before you join the program. In Kenya, medical and pharmacy school admission is based again on the national examination. Usually they admit the students who score the highest in the national exam, and you sh uh, on average it's an A. And also engineering program. Uh, to join engineering program, most times you need to have an A in the national examination. So there's a little difference compared to the, the US system. Um, so I'll talk about the university I worked with, which is known as Technical University of Kenya. I'll give the history. And this will give you an idea of how the 30 universities have been created the last uh, 15 years. So Technical University of Kenya is located in Nairobi. That is the capital city of Kenya. It was established as Kenya Technical Institute in 1961. And its main focus was to train middle-level manpower. That is what you'd call technicians or technologists. Uh, I was renamed as Kenya Polytechnic uh, in 1967. And this is a picture of the capital city of Nairobi. Uh, it's uh, Nairobi, which is the capital city of Kenya. About four million people work and live uh, in Nairobi and its environment. So it's densely populated. So which means traffic is a nightmare, especially when it rains. Uh, so remember the name changed to Kenya Polytechnic. So as Kenya Polytechnic, uh, it offered education and training at certificate, diploma, and higher diploma level. Now the education was terminal, which meant a student could not proceed uh, beyond higher diploma. And they mostly trained in technical fields, architecture, surveying, and planning. Those are some of the technical fields they trained in. So the government established a policy framework uh, in 2005 to upgrade national polytechnics to degree awarding institutions. And so Kenya Polytechnic was upgraded to um, degree awarding institution as a university college in 2007. And that's a picture of a Kenya Polytechnic. It's located in downtown Nairobi uh, in a busy street. Uh, so since now it was a degree awarding institution, the name changed to Kenya Polytechnic University College. And as a university college, it was a constituent college of the University of Nairobi. Uh, university of Nairobi is the oldest university in Kenya. It was established in 1956. I'm an alumni of the University of Nairobi. 
Uh, degree programs were approved by the Senate of University of Nairobi because he, was the man, he acted as the mentor. And the institution was still required to offer degrees in their areas of expertise. And uh, they had their first cohort of degree students in 2009, and that was mostly in engineering program. In fact, the first cohort was electrical engineering, and it's the largest program in the university. Um, so uh, later in 2012, it was elevated to, um, it became a full university status. And after it became a full university status, again, the name changed to Technical University of Kenya, which is the name you saw in the flyer. Uh, and so it's a now fully accredited institution. They, con they continue the tradition of producing technologies or technicians. They offer various degree pro uh, programs at bachelor's level. And last four, they offered uh, the first master's uh, program. And since, as you saw from the, just the three slides, it's a relatively new institution, so they are currently revising existing curricula and creating new programs, which is the reason why I worked with the institution. So if you see, notice the picture is the same. What changed is uh, just the name. <laughs> okay, so uh, the first time I worked at the university was last summer. Um, uh, Rick did mention, um, so last summer for two months, and this year, or last year summer for two months, and this year summer, last summer for three months. Now the first time I worked with the university, we did develop, uh, we came up with the first draft of a medicinal chemistry curriculum, and I participated in outreach activities or mentorship activities. And because we were not able to finish what we, um, the, or to accomplish the project goals, uh, I worked with the Vice President for Academics, Research, and Students, and we wrote a proposal requesting for renewal for me to go back last summer and complete the project activities. Uh, this slide shows the, uh, what we included in the proposal, so I'll talk about the specific activities. So the main activity was developing medicinal chemistry curriculum. Uh, for students, medicinal chemistry involves the design, synthesis, and development of bioactive molecules, or you can say pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, usually, some bioactive molecules is commonly used. And this uh, program involves various disciplines. Uh, the main ones are chemistry and biology, or pharmaco uh, pharmacology. Now, uh, with chemistry, the specific, it's not just chemistry, specific, the main uh, discipline or area under chemistry is organic chemistry. And I'm an organic chemist, which is why I worked on the program. So when I arrived this year in June, uh, beginning of June, I met the team we had worked with uh, last year and we had to find out where the, the status of the curriculum. And the first thing we did was to reschedule our retreat so that we could finalize on the curriculum because I knew I was not going to get another renewal to go back and finish up uh, the program. So we had a retreat um, for four days, three nights at a place called Millera Resort. And besides, so we did three main things. We reviewed the core developed curriculum. This was completed last year, summer, in the two months I worked the first time. And we also proposed points to consider when establishing a formal agreement with local industries. Um, last year, I, in, I initiated a discussion between the university and two local industries because the program requires the students to do an internship outside the institution. So I had to find internship opportunities for those students. And so because the industries were open, we wanted to take advantage of that and probably initiate a partnership between the university so other programs could benefit. So during our retreat, we discussed the points. We thought both the local industry and the university would benefit. I'll show you some of the points we, di we discussed. At the same time, we designed laboratory chemistry experiments, and these are for the courses which had a lab component and uh, what they call internal industry-based learning activities. That is equivalent of independent research projects. So I'll show you the techniques the students are expected to complete, uh, to acquire by the time they complete the independent research projects before they can proceed to do an internship outside the university. 
Um, so these are pictures of us at the retreat. So after we arrived, we, uh, we had to form groups based on our areas of expertise. Uh, this first group here reviewed uh, analytical and physical chemistry. These are the, some of the lab stuff, they helped us organize the chemistry experiments. Uh, the, the big group was organic chemistry. I mentioned medicinal chemistry involves mostly organic chemistry. And we had two people review our uh, inorganic and also one person helped review computational chemistry. I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, now this additional one person here, he reviewed uh, nanochemistry and nanomedicine, which is part of the program. Uh, you see, I'm sure you've seen everybody else in the second slide. And on our last day of our retreat, we had one person from each group present what they had done so that the entire team was familiar with the changes we were going to make and also give the team an opportunity uh, to add or make any changes or give at least their input. So the last two slides show some uh, first uh, on the bottom, first one show one of the person, this is from organic chemistry presenting, and obviously here they were listening. Uh, so after the retreat, we had, uh, before we left um, after the retreat, we obviously agreed to now finish up compiling, edit, and after editing, we, uh, we had to work with the registrar's office and other offices involved to get the coding and finalize the uh, uh, program. So I'll show you now the final curriculum, which has, is midway through the approval process. So the first two years are mostly the same courses we teach here at Montgomery College. Now you'll see two different codes, UCC and SPCH. UCC stands for undergraduate common courses. That is equivalent of general education. You know, it's just different terminologies. Uh, SPCH, SP stands for School of Physical, CH Chemistry. Those are the program courses. Uh, 48 hours is equivalent to 12 weeks of teaching, four hours a week for a course which has no lab. If a course has a lab, they have two hours of lecture and three hours of lab, so one lab per week. Um, so I'll just go through the slides. If you have any question, you let me know after the presentation. After the presentation. So you. So most of the courses, again, as I said, are same courses we teach at Montgomery College. First two years. Now the program courses start mostly from third year. And I'm sure some of the title of the courses look like a one chapter, but they go into details. After completing, successfully completing year three, semester two, the students will have to do an independent research project. That is slightly different from how we do it here because the research project is thorough. They'll have to, it'll take a whole semester. And so they work on different activities in uh, different small projects in chemistry, uh, biology, and pharmacy to learn the skills they need in order to succeed in uh, their field. I'll show you some of the techniques after finishing the next few slides. So year four, semester two, you notice there are a few courses because they have to complete a second research project. Uh, which is equivalent to four, uh, four courses. Uh, and so during this time, they should be able now to apply the skills they acquired in their third year, uh, third semester. And they'll be evaluated after completing uh, the research project. After successfully completing year four, semester two, uh, they will have completed all the coursework. So at that point, they will need to do an internship in one of the industry, obviously, the industry has to be approved by the department to make sure that they will acquire the skills they need. Uh, they call internship industry-based learning. External means it's outside the institution. Internal means it's in the institution where they are supervised by lab staff and their faculty. 
uh, again, that's um, equivalent to a whole semester. So the program will basically take five years, not four years because of the two additional semesters. Uh, these are the skills they'll be expected to learn when they complete the internal attachment. I changed it to internal attachment it may have, uh, in their third year, third semester. So you'll notice if you teach uh, labs, these are the same skills we emphasize when we teach. Uh, I think the first three are self-explanatory. Uh, the separation and purification will be from the simplest te technique, let's say using a separatory funnel, to more advanced purification techniques like using chromatography instrumentation. Uh, quantitative chemical analysis is referred to using chemical tests. Um, titration and gravimetric analysis, if that's familiar. It's just determining amount and also determining the substance. Uh, biochemical analysis, this will be more like the pharmacy part where they will be expected to learn the techniques used in analyzing bioactive molecules in living organisms. And it will also include like the techniques used to test illegal drugs. So they will need to learn that. Identification and quantification of compounds will include all the different uh, instrumentation from atomic absorption to chromatography, again, for example, higher pressure liquid chromatography and so forth. Uh, this is a continuation. So for organic, they will first do a one-step reaction just to be able to at least get some product out of it. Then they'll later do a multi-step synthesis or more than one step. And um, they'll practice their writing skills, referencing by compiling the lab, lab report where they'll obviously talk about the different project activities they accomplished. And the department will organize at least one industrial visit so that they can see application of what they learn in lecture, how it's applied in the industry. And they will be assessed on the skills through a presentation, and they will also take an exam uh, so that they know if the research, uh, independent research project uh, activity was uh, helpful to the students. Uh, so uh, since I showed you the curriculum, it's all complete. Um, before I left, it had already been approved by the department. And obviously, the department had to approve because they are the same people who went for the retreat. So there's no way they were not going to approve it. Otherwise, it would have forced them to continue working on it. After it was approved by the department, it was forwarded to the School of Physical Sciences, which you saw is part of the code. And they approved the curriculum last, last month. I understand it was recently presented to the Faculty of Applied Sciences and Technology. They've not set a date to uh, discuss it and probably approve. Uh, and usually with the approval, they also make recommendations which the department has to correct or any, anything they feel needs to be added, they do that before it's forwarded to the next level. After the faculty will be forwarded to the Dean's Committee and then the University Senate. And after it's approved, it's approved by the University Senate, it will be forwarded to the Commission of University Education, for University Education. That's the equivalent of Maryland Higher Education Commission. So they'll obviously approve before they publish. And after they publish, the uh, institution plans to advertise the program in February next year. I'm not sure if that will be possible, but that's the plan and they plan to launch the program next fall. If it's, once it's implemented, the institution will be the first uh, university in Kenya to offer medicinal chemistry program. Uh, so um, still tied to the curriculum, as I mentioned to you earlier, I had to initiate discussion between two local industries. I'll just show you the names of the two local industries, Pharmacy and Poisons Board, this is a government agency which is mostly used with uh, safety, toxicity, efficacy of drugs. They also license the um, pharmacy uh, curricula. Uh, they license, they give licenses to pharmacies and they also approve pharmacy curriculum. So I visited the uh, industry um, or the body with uh, two people from the department and we discussed the points we had proposed during our retreat. I will show you in a minute. And um, the people we met liked the points we had proposed. 
and they did suggest we could also, uh, the institution could enter into uh, in a partnership, a sort of a partnership with the university. And um, they got their lawyer involved, so the lawyer is currently working with the Office of Partnership uh, to draft a memorandum of understanding. Uh, the second industry is known as Kenya Bureau of Standards. This is a quality assurance, inspection, and training and certification body. It's mostly involved with uh, all consumer products except drugs, because drugs are um, under Pharmacy and Poisons Board. So we had a similar meeting with some of its employees. And again, after our discussion, they were open to having a partnership with the university. And they did send a template to the uh, office of, uh, involved with partnership, and they're using that to draft the memorandum of understanding. So I'm hoping by maybe next year, we'll have a formal agreement between the institution and the two local industries. Uh, so I'll just let you look at some of the points which will go into the first draft of the Memorandum of Understanding. So this slide shows what the university was requesting from the two industries. The last one applied to the quality assurance um, and certification body, not to both industries. And to, since it's a partnership, we wanted to make sure that also the local industries benefit. So we did propose four points, uh, which we thought uh, at least the, also the local industries uh, would take advantage of. I'll give you a minute to look at the four points we proposed. Obviously, we have less as compared to what we were asking, but we gave them the opportunity to add more, and they seem to be happy with just the four points. Uh, but TUK is a short form of Technical University of Kenya. Okay. So these points will be in the first draft of the formal agreement of Memorandum of Understanding. Um, it might change because obviously after it's drafted, they will review. Uh, they might add or delete some of the points, but at least we have something to start the discussion. Uh, so that basically summarizes the curriculum uh, development. So I'll show you a few slides on uh, active learning class I, had, I facilitated with one of the professors. Um, so uh, the, one of the organic chemistry professor wanted to try group activity in an organic chemistry one class for engineering students. But the class she was assigned to teach was really small. I don't know, you can tell just from the pictures, it's very crowded. So she asked me if I could join a beginning of lecture and help facilitate the groups because she, want, she was trying that for the first time. So I went beginning of lecture, we asked the students to break into groups of four to five. Then we distributed the worksheet she had prepared. And our work was to facilitate, just walk around, make sure the students stay on task, and answer any questions they had. Um, this is the professor. Right, so you can see, moving around was really a challenge. <laughs> it was really tight. And, but the students seemed to enjoy working in groups. This was their first time they were doing that. Um, I need to take a note. This is the size of the whiteboard in most of the classrooms. There's no smart workstation, so which means that for instructors who use technology in their teaching, it's, um, it's impossible to do that. So most of the classroom, I did visit many of the classrooms, that's the size of the whiteboard, no smart workstation. And this is not unusual in many universities in Kenya, so cr overcrowding and not having enough resources is typical of many universities in Kenya. So technical university is just one example. Uh, this shows the size of the classroom, very small with very many students, but we made it possible, and that's basically how they teach in those classes. Uh, so the second activity I was involved in is mentorship, uh, and I'll just show you the activities we did with um, students in, from middle school and high school. 
So I worked with an outreach team. They have an outreach team and a director. And this was after the retreat, so we came up with a work plan to visit two girls' high school. Last year, we worked with middle school students. And um, the two high schools we worked with, one is known as McQueney Girls High School. Uh, and I'll mention most of the high schools are boarding, so parents visit once a year, uh, once, once a month, their kids unless one, a student has medical need. Um, so after we, uh, we had signed the visitor's book, we met uh, 11th graders. It wasn't possible to meet all the students because of the size. 11th graders were 250. And since we needed to do activities, it was even difficult for us to even control the entire group. So uh, this is the vice president for academics research and students. He was very involved because he wrote the proposal with me. So he started by talking about the university. So they used this opportunity to market the university also. I gave a short talk to the girls to encourage them to pursue careers in STEM. I gave them examples of some of the challenges they were experiencing as women in STEM. But I also gave them examples of women who had very successful careers to just sweat as an encouragement. After the short presentation, we, had, we started our activities. Uh, many of these activities are familiar. So the first activity we did was a demonstration. This is an example of a chemical reaction, decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. It produces oxygen and water. And to dramatize the reaction, you use dishwashing soap. So what you're seeing is a dishwashing soap, and you add color to it, obviously, to make it more colorful. After the first demonstration, we asked the students to break into groups. Um, and as I said, we had a big group, so we asked the students to break into groups of 10 so that we could manage. We were six of us. And so we had to make sure at least we could uh, kind of control the students. So the first like, hands-on activity they worked on was uh, they had to extract the juice in red cabbage. Uh, this uh, substance in it, we change its color based on if you have an acid or base. So we wanted them to find out. They already know the theory, but they do very little hands-on activity. So we wanted to give them that opportunity. After they extracted the juice, uh, we gave them different substances, so, and we told them what to look for. So if it's an acid, the color changes to pink. If it's base, it changes to green. So you can see it's pink because they added, um, they squeezed in orange, um, orange juice. Uh, this is the same activity. We distributed just different substances. They know the theory, but they've, they've not had a chance at least to try those activities in, uh, on their own. Uh, the second uh, hands-on activity we did was application of chemistry, specifically polymers. So we had them make a rubber, uh, like called, it's called silly party or a ball, which you can bounce. And to make the ball, they used uh, Elm, uh, Elmer's glue and borax. And it's green because they added food coloring, because they like, students like things which are colored. At uh, the same time on polymers, we gave them different types, uh, different brands of diapers. Uh, we wanted them to find out what really absorbs urine in the diapers. Most of them thought it's the padding. So we asked them to add water, determine the brand which absorbed most of the water. Then uh, they cut the diaper open to see what was really absorbing the uh, water. And so they were really surprised to find a gel inside. Obviously, it starts a polymer beads, and as it absorbs water, it, uh, it becomes a gel. So at least now they know what really absorbs uh, urine. And we, this was an, another example of chemistry or polymer application. Uh, the last uh, activity we did was a demonstration, and that is using dry ice or solid carbon dioxide uh, we use this time uh, indicators from the lab, again, to show that when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, it, it's, a, it, it's an acid, it changes the color of the indicator. At uh, the same time, we wanted to show them chemistry is fun or science is fun. So we used the uh, dry ice to make ice cream. And to make ice cream, uh, we made it very simple. We mix whole milk, uh, cream, sugar, and we use vanilla because vanilla is a common flavor. 
So we mix all, and since we didn't have a, a freezer to cool it, now we added dry ice to solidify. Again, just to show you can do much, well, you can do a lot with science. And later we served the ice cream to them, and they realized it tasted almost the same as what you'd buy from uh, the store. So after the last activity, the university presented 20 hot plates to the school. The engineering program makes uh, the hot plates, so they had many, and the, student, and the school used the hot plates the way uh, as they need them. So this is one school. Uh, the second one, I'll just go through, it's the same activities. It's known as Nia Gauss High School. And I'm sure you've noticed the students are in uniform. In Kenya schools, public schools, students are required to wear a uniform, but also private schools require students to wear a uniform. Uh, this, again, is the team, part of the team. Uh, this is, again, the Vice President for Academics, Research, and Students. He uh, talked about the university. I gave a similar talk to the students, and we had someone else talk about the different programs the university offers. Again, they used that opportunity to market the university. And uh, I'll just go through the slides. It's the same activities. Now, this time we, we met the students outside. 11th graders were 300. So there was no enough big room to accommodate them and also give us space to do the activities. So the same now, this is still, because the reaction produces heat. And so we had the students confirm, we asked two students to touch, it's just soap and they wash their hands. Hydrogen peroxide is a disinfectant. Um, same experiment, extracting uh, the juice from red cabbage. And they tested uh, different substances. So you can see now green. Uh, this is uh, application of uh, polymers, making the rubber or the ball. Uh, this time the students cut the diaper open where they saw the gel which was absorbing water. Then they transferred the gel to plastic cups and decided to keep that for their science classes. And the last activity was, again, making ice cream. We made ice cream to, uh, for the 300 students. So we had to take turns, you know, as you keep mixing. If it gets solid, it's really hard to mix it. And the students had an opportunity to ask questions um, or talk to the uh, TUK staff. Uh, this time we served the ice cream different. We had a hard time in the other school, so we asked the students to line up. So you can imagine being the last person. And after they were served, they had to go for their lunch because at this point it was around two o'clock and they had not had lunch yet. And you can see they're enjoying the ice cream before lunch. And then again, this university donated half plates. See, the engineering program uh, makes the half plates. So uh, this just shows the summary of the different activities I've just talked about. So there are a few educational exchange programs I'm, fa I'm familiar with, which are managed by the Institute of International Education. Um, and I know some of you are familiar with at least the first two, Fulbright Scholar Program. Uh, this is funded by the U.S. government, and it's... Um, it allows U.S. Ed educators to work with institutions outside the U.S. on either teaching projects, uh, research, or both teaching and research. And uh, one visit lasts two to 12 months. Applications are, re are, renewed once, uh, are reviewed once a year. I think uh, the deadline was in August, so they are in the process of reviewing. There's a second one called Fulbright Spe Specialist Program. It's not many people are aware about it. It's uh, also funded by the U.S. government, and again, it allows U.S. educators to work with institutions outside the U.S. on short projects, and mostly like, let's say, institution planning, cu curriculum review. So the U.S. educators are service experts or consultants in those small projects, which take maximum six weeks. Applications are reviewed multiple times a year, and once someone has applied, you stay in the roster, or one stays in the roster for three years before they drop the name. Uh, there's a new program which was, which was launched in 
fall, in fact, in September. It's called Greek Diaspora Fellowship Program. And this program uses, for, uh, uses the same model as the uh, Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program. This is for people who are born in Greece but are US educators. So they get a fellowship to go back to Greece and work with institutions in Greece. So it's uh, partially funded by the Greece government, and I think there's a grant for that also. Applications are being accepted now until uh, they close in January 31st. So for anyone who qualifies or is interested, you can look at um, the program. Just type the Greek Diaspora Fellowship Program, it will take you to the website. I talked about the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program. Um, Again, the visit lasts from two weeks to three months. Now, for students, the program I'm familiar with, again, is the uh, Fulbright U.S. Student Program. Uh, you, this, you can only qualify if you already have a bachelor's degree, or you must have a bachelor's degree at the start of the grant. But if you are considering teaching, studying, or doing research outside the United States after completing your degree. This is a program to consider. So now switch to, so that's basically what I did uh, regarding the educational project. So I'll finish up my presentation by showing you some of the uh, competitive advantages in Kenya I mentioned. So competitive advantage in Kenya is availability of natural resources. Um, and one, water, because it's located along the Indian Ocean. They have a lot of wildlife, fossil land, forest, and minerals. This map shows the weather in Kenya. So red indicates arid, desert climate, so not really much happens there. Uh, next is semi-arid, and the light blue indicates the areas where they get enough rainfall for agriculture. Deep blue means, uh, obviously, it's heavy rainfall. And the green um, indicate uh, it's, usually, it's usually dry, but when it rains, at least they get enough rainfall. That's basically a general overview of the climate in Kenya. So only half of the country is used for agriculture, or at least gets enough rainfall. Um, so tourism sector is the second largest source of foreign revenue in Kenya. The largest is agriculture. And it, the tourism sector benefits from many national parks and reserves. Uh, this map shows the different national parks and reserves. Uh, the, the area shaded it re indicates relatively the size of the national park. And each, each national park is known for a certain type of wildlife. So if someone visiting would have to inquire based on whatever type of animals you want to see, then uh, they tell you which the best national park to go see that, uh, the that type of uh, wildlife. Um, and again, because of its location along the Indian Ocean, it has beautiful beaches which attract both local and international tourists. So I'll start by showing you a video of um, so I'll show you um, the, what attracts tourists to two national parks. Uh, there's one here in Masai Mara National Reserve and Lake Bogoria National Reserve. I, at least for those two, just to give you an idea of uh, the tourist activity or what attracts tourists to those, um, some of the national parks. So I'll start with, um, have to, Yeah, that's the first one. So the, this is Masai Mara National Reserve is known for the great animal migration. Is that familiar? Uh, this is natural movement of animals throughout the year. There's no start, no end. And uh, the animals move between Kenya and the neighboring country. And so in Kenya, that's the Masai Mara National Reserve I showed you, what is considered as the 
main attraction is the animals crossing a river with crocodiles. So that's why you see the animals moving in a circle. There's a crocodile in between. So I'll have you watch the video. So this is what attracts local and international uh, tourists to that national reserve. Okay, this is done. <laughs> uh. Okay, let's click on this one. Yeah. So let me watch. It's the same National uh, Reserve. I want you to see how the National Reserve looks beside just the river. So you notice on one side there's no grass, so that forces the animal to cross to the other side as they look for food. So the animal migration involved, it's more than one million animals crossing the river. And you notice that the animals move in a line. Where the first animal steps, that's where the last one steps. They always move in a line. Uh, the tourists usually don't get out of their car, or they stay in the car because there are other animals. There are lions, buffaloes, and elephants. Uh, you'll see the vehicle somewhere. Yeah, there you go. So they, yeah. So they drive close to the rivers to see the animals, but they don't get out of their cars. Okay, so this gives you an idea of the national park. Okay. Let's get it. Uh, let's go back to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second park, I want to show you how, what attracts tourists to uh, the park is known as Lake Bogori. I showed you in the map. And Lake Bogoria is an alkaline lake, which is located in a geothermal active region. And the, uh, the geothermal activity is characterized by presence of geysers and hot springs. And when I say alkaline, the pH is about 10. So any plant, if, if a plant comes in contact with water, it dries up. People say it's very salty. But it's also a home for many flamingos. Uh, so that attracts tourists, the flamingos, and also the geysers. So I'll have you see, I took a video of the guy. So we have it's So the water subsides and all of a sudden it's again it jets out.
this will at least help you see how the lake looks like. So there used to be many geysers, but this is the only geyser I saw the last time I visited because the water level has risen so much. So not many now are visible. And there are small uh, geysers on the side. People use those to boil eggs. It's just to confirm that the water is hot enough to boil an egg. So uh, I took a picture while I was there and at where the geyser is. So you see a, line, a pink line all the way at the back. That it's basically the flamingos. Because of human activity, they don't come close to the shore. But where people don't visit, they come close to the shore because they feed on the algae, the green stuff you see. Uh, so as I said, the water level has risen so much. This was the initial road. Now it's all completely covered with water. So the government had to construct a road, another road, to enable people obviously, to be able to go to visit the geyser. Uh, the green you're seeing, again, is the algae, what the uh, uh, flamingos feed on. I took a nice picture of that. And I understand the algae grows quickly in that um, basic water or alkaline water so that obviously maintains the flamingos so it attracts the flamingos and uh, when, where you notice where the water is in contact with the trees they are all dried up because it's very alkaline or you can say it's very salty uh, I, there's a resort next to the lake where people stay I, they have very many ostriches so I took a picture of some of the ostriches and this is a picture of the Kenyan coast. As I said, they have beautiful beaches. And the Kenyan coast is divided into two. There's the north and the south. Uh, and what divides the north and the south is this harbor here. And so if one is in a beach in the north coast to go to the south coast, you must cross that harbor. There's no other way to get there. And it takes about 10 minutes to cross. And we use uh, these double-sided boats, they're called ferries, to cross the harbor. I have an up-close picture of that. So the, bo the boat carries both road and um, foot traffic. So this is how it looks like. So you have the vehicles in the middle and people on the side. It's called Likoni Ferry. And the place is also called Likoni. Um, so lastly, I'll briefly talk about uh, the people. I haven't mentioned anything about the people. The Maasai is one of the ethnic groups in Kenya. There are 42 ethnic uh, groups or 42 tribes. The park you saw earlier with the animal migration is named after the people who live there, the Maasai. Now, the Maasai have maintained their traditional way of life. In other words, they live a different life from the rest of the Kenyans, despite pressure from the government to change. They have no attachment to possessions, and about 70% of them, which is a million of them, are unable to read or write, So, which is why the government has been putting so much pressure so that they can change their way of life. They live a nomadic life. And these are the type of houses they live in, because they're always migrating in search of food for their cattle. So what they value most is cattle. They believe um, uh, somebody's wealth is based on how many cattle that person has. And yeah. you'll notice all the men are holding a stick. They are trained to carry a stick. That is to protect their family. And because also of their way of life, they must have a stick uh, to protect themselves from animals. They tend to spend most of the time in the forest. Uh, the ladies wear ca colorful clothes. And you notice all of them are in red. So red is their color. They say that represents them. And 
This picture shows the cattle. So someone with cattle, they tend to carry a spear, again, to protect their animal from, their cattle from wildlife, especially lions. And you notice, again, this man is also holding a stick, so they always carry a stick. They are trained to do that. And finally, I would like to thank the Carnegie Foundation uh, for funding. United States International University of Africa, I did not mention about the university, but they provide a vision for the program um, I participated in. Institute of International Education managed the program, it's the contact office. Uh, Montgomery College for support. Uh, my former dean, Dr. Cheng, wrote a letter of recommendation when I applied for the program. And Technical University for having the opportunity to work with them. And thank you so much for coming and listening.